Australia Bank is carbon neutral and I found that out because I went to their website one day and it said right across the front in the biggest letters the bank is carbon neutral and I thought well what does that mean? So I went to look it up and um, I had to click on to uh, the download centre and it took me to their um, the annual report. You had to read the annual report and there was an appendix in the annual report that explained how um, the National Australia Bank was carbon neutral. Now this was a few years ago and they've improved their act a bit since then because I managed to find the carbon neutral part in the annual report but now if you look around the National Australia's um, website you, you just can't understand it. There's all these PDFs you can download here and, and you look at a PDF and it just doesn't say anything. Like it doesn't have any numbers in it. So the way they were carbon neutral, I'm talking about 2010 or so, what they did was um, they, they looked at all their carbon emissions in their air travel and that had increased and their electricity use that had increased and um, their car travel that had increased uh, and their air conditioning usage which had increased and they had this beautiful picture, this beautiful picture of a large foyer with luxury lounge chairs, all air conditioned, really nice, and nobody in it. And that was their carbon neutral picture. Um, so what they've done, of course, is paid about $4.70 to some third world country to convince them to not build a coal um, power station, but instead to build a rice husk power station. And apparently if, car if National Australia Bank emits all that carbon and those guys just keep doing what they were doing, that's carbon neutral. So that's the mathematics and the accounting of carbon neutral. I tried the uh, Virgin Australia website today and um, a similar problem. You know, I tried to look up carbon. I just, uh, I've got a bookmark for that. Carbon, no. Oh, well, anyway, I asked about carbon offsets. Have you found it? Oh, yeah. I asked about carbon offsets and it took me to another page and that, there we go, fly carbon neutral and you have to um, go to this facts on carbon neutral page and that says if you want to find more details and it sends you back to the original page again. So they're, they're doing a much better job now of hiding what they're actually doing. But with the Virgin Airlines you can pay like a dollar twenty and apparently that offsets all the carbon of your whole flight. A dollar twenty, that's only like one percent. Isn't that the solution to the whole carbon problem? If we just pay one percent more, all the problem would go away. Isn't that easy? <laughs> Unfortunately, I got conned by it because I had those low energy fluorescent light bulbs installed in my home. That was good, so I'd reduced my carbon emissions. Uh, but then somebody offered me one of those little electric meters for $50, and I bought one of those. And the service was installing the meter and replacing all my bulbs with low energy. But of course, I already had low energy bulbs, so I was just paying 50 bucks to get the meter. I thought that was good. Unfortunately, what I didn't realize is that by getting that, I've signed up my house to their carbon offsets program, whoever sponsored that, right? So now all my low emissions don't belong to me, they belong to whoever paid for it. And I think it was Virgin Airlines $1.50 for their things. That's what, so now, uh, you know, I'm counted as emitting all this carbon even though really I'm not. So I've got the solution. The solution to make my business carbon neutral is after all you guys go, I'm going to switch these lights off, all right, and I'm going to claim the carbon credits for having these lights switched off. Now that's one, two, three, four, five. And if I just do that every meeting I go to, see there's two, there's two or three kilowatts of lights here. If, I, if I'm the one who switches it off, then I get the credit for three kilowatts of lights left off for, you know, ten hours. So that's what I'm going to do. Thank you. Okay, after Steve we'll have Alvaro. Ditch, last ditch attempt to try and do this. It doesn't, I don't need it. The time starts now. Oh, it's on. <laughs> okay. Right, I'm ready. Uh, it's me again. I've done so much talking this uh, conference. Um, I uh, run this hack space here on the Gold Coast called Gold Coast Tech Space along with another few volunteers and about a, a year and a half ago a young fellow um, dropped into our hacker space, uh, his name's Skip and he was at the dinner last night, I brought him along. Uh, he grew up in uh, Norfolk Island, I don't know if you know about Norfolk Island but it's a very 
resourceful place. They're a resourceful bunch. And he just got back from the UK, he'd been running pubs over in the UK for many years. And while he was in the UK, he taught himself electronics while running the pubs. And uh, yeah, he came along to our hex space with all these PCBs and all these things he designed himself. And I had no idea that hobbyists could do their own PCBs. I was just how naive of me. And we got talking about uh, how fun it was to hack around, but also could we actually do something commercial and actually make a little business out of something. And we were doing a lot of things with Arduino. And um, so um, Skip had this idea of us making our own Arduino board. He, everyone at the Hackerspace thought it was a great idea, but no one did anything about it apart from me and Skip. So we just decided we would own it and we would do it and we would create these things called the GC Arduino. And so we created our own little Arduino uh, box. Uh, board and uh, I put a few in the boxes on there and it's been a really really interesting experience actually uh, making a device from the from the base and even packaging it and doing the website doing everything and um, especially for Skip because he had never run a business or anything like that before so uh, we both learned a lot from it uh, we bought a whole load of machinery uh, it still hasn't quite paid for itself yet but we have a CNC router that we use for cutting out solder stencils and lots of other things we have a pick and place machine I don't know if anyone's seen a pick and place machine a little robot that um, we get our boards made in China but we uh, also have a little solder reflow oven that we made out of a pizza oven and a thermocouple and uh, we haven't automated it yet we just watch it what's the temperature uh, it's been so much fun and so we've made these little uh, GC Reno boards we sell a kit there for fifty dollars it comes with about ten exercises very much inspired by what John Oxer does I'm a big fan of John um, but we wanted something that could uh, plug directly into a breadboard so the kids didn't have to have a breadboard and a board and it's nice and tight and simple we also have a robot uh, with a motor driver that this can plug into and the kids can actually build a robot. It costs a, another 50. Um, but we've also recently just made a really, really skunkworks robot that you can make out of an old um, mobile phone battery, one of these, and a, where with, for the bump sensor, which normally you'd use somewhere, we just have a resistor with the end of the resistor bent around like that, and as it touches the gates, it works beautifully as a, as a bump sensor. So that's uh, really cool. I'm going to put that, um, try and get Skip to put that on Hacker Day. And it's, a, it's a great little um, thing. So we have a website, we have a whole load of projects on there. And this is the kit we sell to the kids. Um, we sold quite a lot of these from our holiday workshops. But it's exhausting, absolutely exhausting doing these holiday workshops. And I've kind of took a break from it now. But we are still selling a few through the Hacker Space. And I also have them listed on Little Bird Electronics. So uh, when Marcus Shappy came up a few months ago, he really liked it and he says, well, give me some stock on consignment. So I gave him four, and they're on Little Bird Electronics, and they haven't sold yet. So you can go on Little Bird Electronics and buy one if you want. Um, we also have a, a. How am I going for the time, Jacinta? One and a half. Uh, we also have an adaptation of this, the GC Dewey Node, which is the one which I will be doing my. Um, workshop on tomorrow and that is a, a, a version of this board but it's network ready it has lots of little sockets for putting packet radios on there bluetooth wireless and uh, that one we're not really selling yet we're just using for our own uh, purposes for prototyping our own products but uh, if there's interest i don't mind selling them they work out about uh, uh, $25 each or something like that i think i'm selling the, the the workshop i'm doing tomorrow is $50 and it's basically at at cost of what we sell them for two for 50. Um, so we think they're really nicely reasonably priced. We also brand everything Gold Coast Tech Space on the back, not that it's, it's not, this isn't a Gold Coast Tech Space project, but we just use that as a way to get exposure for our space and that they're Gold Coast made and that people should be sort of proud of making things locally and doing something locally. So it's, it's been a really nice project. There's a lot of uh, nice feel good factor to it. So I've had a lot of fun. And one day we'll probably just about break even on all our machines. So, But I have ones here that if anyone wants to buy one, you're welcome to buy one more for me, $50 straight up. Um, and we've got, uh, if I, the, once I've sold the batch I have at the moment, we'll fire up the pick and place and make some more. And, uh, um, yeah, I thought everyone was rubbing their hands there thinking, oh, awesome, I see Drinos. <laughs> but I realise it's the time. <laughs> Thank you. Excellently timed. Okay, now we have Alvaro, and following Alvaro will be Fraser. Cool. So what I'm going to be talking about started off as a sort of hobby and pet project. 
and it's about what Lynn was talking about this morning. So we know that open source is sort of the way to go, but how does that look like in government? We've seen the experience of what has happened in the US, but what does that look like here in Australia? And more importantly, how can government, tech, and industry, and citizens work together um, on issues that sort of affect us all? And how can we create a civic tech ecosystem? And why would, should government pay attention to the stuff that we're doing. Um, so this is some of the stuff that we're going to be covering tomorrow um, in the workshop. And I'll leave it till there. Thank you. OK, next we have Fraser. And following Fraser, we will have Ian. Yes, OK. So a very simple expression type. Uh, so we have literal integers, uh, sums of two integers, and two integers being multiplied. We have a expression tree transform, the uh, elimination of multiplication of anything with the multiplicative identity that is 1. So if it's a literal, we just return the literal. If it's an add, we just descend. Uh, if it's a multiplication, if either the left-hand side or the right-hand side is 1, then we eliminate that and descend into the, uh, the other operand. And uh, finally, if, it is, uh, if neither is 1, then we just descend on both branches. OK. A property um, does eliminate. Takes an expression tree and checks whether or not there are any uh, multiplications with the <coughs> multiplicative identity in the tree. So if it's a literal, the property holds. If it's a, an add AB, then we can descend on both branches and conjoin them. And if it's a multiplication, if either of the operands is the literal one, then the property is false. Otherwise, we just descend on both branches. OK, let us test this property. We have a problem. No instance for arbitrary expra. So it doesn't know how to build an arbitrary expression to test with. Let us change this. Instance arbitrary expro where arbitrary is sized gen where gen zero. So what we're going to do is we're going to reduce as we construct an arbitrary tree so that we don't build an infinite tree um, and just warm up our CPU and never return an answer. So if we are at a uh, leaf, we can just return uh, one of either the uh, pure literal number one or an arbitrary integer wrapped in the literal data constructor. If it's n, then we will halve the integer n. So let n prime equals div n2 in one of I'm off the screen. OK. Uh, we could also have a literal at this point in the tree. So we'll say uh, pure lit, uh, no, sorry, an arbitrary literal, uh, arbitrary, or a uh, add arbitrary, arbitrary, so just two arbitrary uh, sub expressions, or mole. Uh, sorry, this should be gen n prime, as should this and this. OK, so this is an instance that will allow our compiler to work out how to build an arbitrary uh, expression tree. 
So let's reload this. And now we can quick check the property and we have a problem. The property is falsifiable. There is a subtle bug. The problem is on this one here. If we have a uh, literal one on either of those branches, then that could be lifted up and uh, we have a falsifiable property. So what we need to do here is a case analysis on the result. And if it's uh, actually e at mul a lit one, uh, then we need to recurse and try and do another uh, elimination. E. Likewise, if the A is on the right, otherwise we can terminate. Now if we reload and run that and press enter a lot, we have passed the property. So in summary, um, there are subtle bugs uh, that you probably won't pick up in your uh, test examples, so use property-based tests. The library is quick check. Excellent. Thank you very much. So now we have Ian followed by Hello. Damien. Excellent. If Damien can come down and get mic'd up, that'd be great. Going to use someone else's laptop, then someone else's USB stick. That sounds pretty good. Well, the stick was given to me, so... Where? What? Help? Look at this screen, right? So it works. Is it? Look at that, yeah. Left? Okay, can you bring up whatever folder I have on my USB stick? My time has started, I think. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Chromebooks are awesome, yeah? Anyone else got a Chromebook? Okay. Files. There shouldn't be all that stuff there. There it is. Files. No. USB drive. Yes. Okay. Lightning. Okay. Can I see? Can I browse between those pictures? Yeah, just click on one and then you can hit right, left. That right. sounds like a fine plan. Excellent. Okay. We've got stuff. I'd like to give you a little sample of what I've been up to over the last years, over the last year with my, um, my 3D printer and the little OpusTem project that I mentioned yesterday, um, to which the ginger beer is also related. Um, so I should write on the board that the project is at open stem dot com dot au and yes that trails um, okay and the reason calling it open stem and not just mucking around with adrenos and ginger beer is i think the stem you know science technology engineering and math it is very very broad and that is specifically why we're also mucking around with you know 3d printers electronics robotics and ginger beer it is very very broad and of course in the 3d printing there's mathematics and all that kind of stuff um, so this is an ammonite that we've printed. You can feel the texture, you know, so in a, in a lesson about, you know, ancient history, you can actually hold something in your hand, and that's awesome for kids. That is actually quite special. Um, looking at the picture doesn't cut it. You want one of those, and how do you get one cheaply? That's the way, okay? This is Phoebe, my then eight-year-old eight daughter, putting together one of Vic's wrap wraps. Yeah, so that's the same printer you've seen here yesterday and today, the same model, essentially, she put it together. And that, again, is an awesome experience. You build it, you help build it. She knows an awful lot about M6 and M8 bolts and half nuts now. And, you know, she, she figured out which is the right length screw because the, or, or bolt, because the instructions would say grab, a five, grab an M8 that is five centimeters long. And she'd ask me, so what, which one should I grab? And I just gave her a ruler and said, sort it out, you know. <laughs> and she did. And after, after a while, she just picked it by eyeballing it. And that is exactly the point. Yeah. So all these turnkey printers that get put out there, they're still not a consumer product anyway. But the real cool thing about these printers that Vic in particular produces is they're sturdy, they're movable, they will not decalibrate when you pick them up or bump them. 
Um, and to prove it, someone was really stressed, and it was printing this morning. They said, don't bump it, don't bump it, and I just uh, while it was printing. <laughs> You know, I can be a troll on that. I know it will not decalibrate or, or, or destabilize what the print does. So that's, that's the cool thing. Um, so that's uh, what Phoebe got used to, how to work out all that. You know, it, it takes, a, takes a little bit of doing. Um, I should do it in that order. So that was the very first object ever printed, not this one, but the first object ever printed by a rep rep. Um, so that was what Vic and uh, Adrian Bauer printed. That was the second ever object. And I made Vic drag out that object from the vast depths of history because it was no longer on the RepRap site. And I, I actually have one of his printed rings from the original RepRap child. Um, I can't find it at the moment. I've moved so many times, but I've got it. So that's my own, but I, I do like it. Um, who knows that one? It's Simon's cat. Meow. So the kids make cookies with the cookie cutter that they, that they got printed. These are my spare parts. So if anything breaks, that works. <laughs> Useful. The reason you want to print your own is because every mug is slightly different. You can't standardize that. You can't bring a huge, huge range in the shop. You want that. Um, so we visit schools with that set and have them test you know, what are the differences between those, between those calls? The blue one is the one, one we printed here today as well. Anyway, just an example of what we're doing. If you're interested in helping, please contact me either there or here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, okay next up is Damien. Before I start his time running, just a quick question. Are there any late minute volunteers for a talk? Yes, no, good, so come on, come and get mic'd up. Are there any other late minute, last minute volunteers for a talk? Even if it's only an, a couple of minutes long and you desperately want to tell us about something awesome. Okay, thank you. Yep, try now. Talking. Yep. Hello. All right. So a few people have asked me uh, what is Solar Stripe, and as much as I love uh, explaining it, I'm going to do it all uh, to all of you at once. Um, uh, caveat: I am biased because I have been working with Solar Stripe for a couple of years, and I am passionate about it. Um, so I'm just going to go over the API and uh, give you a chance to see if you feel passionate about the code as well. So how do I go to the next screen? Right does nothing. Space does nothing. Here we go, space. All right, what is uh, Silver Stripe? Well, mostly it looks like a CMS because it is. This is a little screenshot of what the uh, CMS interface looks like, uh, editing a page. Um, but it is also an MVC framework built with on top of PHP. It is open source. It is free as in speech and as in beer. And uh, it is community driven and built. And as you know, community is the flux capacitor that makes time, uh, not time travel, uh, open source work. And it looks pretty, but everyone thinks their baby looks pretty, of course. So, um, so the, the, the framework of Silverstripe subscribes to our developer philosophy, which is that Silverstripe is not a, um, a website building interface. It is kind of the platform on, on top of which websites are built. It is not an out-of-the-box, uh, one-size-fits-all solution. It doesn't try to be everything uh, all at once. Uh, but it is meant for developers. It is intended to be uh, converted by developers into useful end products. And you should be able to do just about anything with it. Something I get asked quite a lot is, can Silverstripe do thing? Well, it does a lot of things. Um, generally, my response is yes, it can. But you know, your dev, your dev should be responsible and able to uh, implement thing easily and effectively without having to go through unnecessary hoops. And it should be uh, fun for them to do it as well. And then, of course, it can do thing very well. Uh, hopefully, if you've got competent developers, which I know you will are. All right, so jumping into some code. This is an example uh, model. Uh, this is a page type called Awesome Page. And here are some of the kind of the standard features of a Silver Stripe uh, model implementation. We have a subtitle, which is a database field. There is a has one relation to an image called header. 
Um, so we also support um, many, many relations and other uh, more complicated data relationships. And we have a bit of block of code here um, building the CMS interface for this model. And SilverStripe includes a database migration handler. So if I wrote that code and ran the database migration script, it would generate this awesome page table. It would create the appropriate uh, table rows and columns. All right, SilverStripe also has uh, quite a simple uh, but effective templating language. Um, it separates all of your PHP from your front end view, so you shouldn't see any. Uh, PHP uh, style logic in here, but you can still express simple uh, view based logic such as uh, conditionally displaying content, doing loops, resizing images, and kind of formatting things for different uh, encodings. So you can, you know, uh, safely encode your HTML attributes, your uh, raw XML or HTML blocks, or your strings that you want to display as literal characters. Yeah, I know. And SilverStripe also has a powerful configuration uh, API, which is based on YAML, which is, uh, YAML is not uh, another markup language. Um, one of the things I like about the config is that the client cannot touch it. So you develop a nice, elegant, and effective config, and you can give it to your client with uh, safe and secure knowledge that they're not gonna go in and screw things up, which is kind of unlike WordPress style development, which is kind of uh, open to uh, being misused. Um, I used to be a WordPress developer, so I'm um, t ragging on past Damien. Now this example here, I am demonstrating uh, using uh, dependency injection to swap out my HTML editor with a CKE field. I'm configuring the plugins I want to use. And here are some links. Still a silver stripe with Composer. If you don't have Composer, go to getcomposer.org, run that, you'll have a silver stripe site, and you can start having fun. Thank you. Thank you. So now we have Damien. Yep. Jack, actually. Sorry, no, that was Damien. My mistake. Yes. <laughs> That's okay. We on? Okay, thanks everyone. I uh, wanted to talk uh, briefly this afternoon about uh, OSIA, or Open Source Industry Australia, because we're not quite as well known as we think perhaps we should be. Um, OSIA is the, uh, the industry body for open source uh, businesses in Australia. Our members are uh, businesses, uh, be they companies or sole traders, uh, who operate in Australia and, uh, and have at least one line of business uh, uh, involved commercially with open source software. So much in the same way that uh, Linux Australia are really good at representing the, uh, the community in, uh, in Australia, uh, OSIA uh, seeks to do the same thing for, uh, for the industry here. Uh, and we do that in a, in a, in a number of ways. We, uh, we like to promote, as I guess everyone does here, the uptake of, uh, of open source software, but particularly in uh, industry, government and, uh, and education in Australia, in other words, helping grow the pie for uh, the businesses who are our members. Um, we like to promote Australia globally as a uh, preferred place to, uh, to go to to procure open source services and products, in other words, adding extra pies for our members. Um, and we uh, lobby Australian governments, uh, both the Commonwealth government and state and territory governments, uh, for uh, uh, public policy regimes that are, uh, that are more conducive uh, to the success of open source, or at the very least, uh, at least at less uh, less problematic uh, for uh, for open source businesses in Australia, and I like to think of that as uh, swatting the flies before they land on the pies. Um, We've been more or less successful in, uh, in different areas. Just to give some practical examples of the, uh, of the stuff we've been doing uh, uh, on the public policy side, we've been engaging with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and, uh, uh, and uh, IP Australia uh, on the uh, rather uh, nasty matter of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, we've uh, been taught, we uh, put a submission into the uh, Australian Council on Intellectual Property on the uh, review of the innovation patent system, and we're very glad to see uh, this year that they actually uh, used some of our words in their report, which was nice. Um, on the market front, rather than policy, we uh, uh, like to showcase uh, 
examples of large scale successful open source projects uh, uh, in government and, uh, and, and big business in Australia for our members. There's a, uh, a brochure you can download from the website. Um, how am I doing on time? Two and a half. Two and a half, all right. Um, we do, we do a bunch of other things like that, uh, but really all I wanted to do today was raise a, a little bit of awareness that, uh, that OSIA is out there and we're here to represent the businesses that you guys work in or run and uh, we'd, like to, uh, we'd like to talk more to you. How do you get involved? A few ways. Uh, anyone can, uh, uh, can join the OSIA mailing list. Uh, just go to the website osia.com.au and uh, you can subscribe there. It's a very low traffic list most of the time, except when something uh, of significance happens. For example, this, uh, uh, this week, some of you may have noticed uh, yeah, the New South Wales government uh, put out a, a rather nasty procurement policy that, uh, uh, I don't think I've got time to quote it here, uh, but makes things difficult for open source software suppliers to sell into government in New South Wales, and that's sparked off a big conversation, uh, as it should do. Uh, if you, if for those of you who'd actually like to support the organisation, please feel free to join. It's really quite cheap, and you can do so online again at the, uh, at the website. But most importantly, like everything in the open source world, it's, it's, it's really about everyone just getting together and, uh, and, and, and pitching in and uh, contributing what they're good at, because the, uh, you know, the, the, the sum output of any organisation like this is, uh, is, is always greater than, the, uh, greater than that of the individuals. So please talk to us, engage with us, and let us know what we can do for you. Uh, three of our directors, almost half the board, are here at OSDC, so feel free to come up and talk to me afterwards, or Paul Foxworthy or Tim Purcell, up the back there, and uh, let's see what we can do. Thanks. How's this? Yeah, there we go, can you hear me? Stop it. <laughs> Do it intentionally because it'll probably come up the second time. Give a sec, there you go. Excellent. Okay, I am not doing timing anymore. How exciting. Hey, I've got one over there. Sweet, uh, what am I looking for? PowerPoint. It's always got to hide, right? Okay. talk to you about writing better slides. I've been doing conferencing and I've been doing speech and coaching for a decent amount of time. I have some ideas that work. These ideas work for me. These ideas work for many people. Not every single idea in this tiny, tiny talk is going to work for you. Take the ones you like. Now, first of all, this is not about you. Your slides were perfect. <laughs> all of you. Even if they weren't. Your, your slides worked, people understood what you were saying, it was fine. These are some ideas that you might want to take in, on board for your next talk, not the talk you just gave. So, for example, consider your colours. There are heraldry rules by Humphrey Lude in 1568, where he pointed out you can't put a light colour on a light colour, or a dark colour on a dark colour. Fluoro green's pretty bad too. <laughs> Don't, duh, don't put all the text on your slides. No one is going to actually be able to follow your talk if they are too busy trying to read everything on your slides so that they know what you're talking about. They're just going to switch you off, then they're going to read, because we are visual creatures, and then they're going to come back on and they're going, I don't know what he's talking about, or she's talking about, or she's already said that, because, well, actually, no, I read it. So, less text, less text. Likewise, don't put everything in your diagrams. <laughs> Complicated images are terrible. If you need a diagram, and I love diagrams, more diagrams, diagrams are great, and code too, excellent. Put the text bits that don't absolutely need to be on your diagram on another page. I usually have it between one and six, but usually more like six slides per minute. 
Some speakers I know who do an excellent job have 10 slides per minute. More slides are not a bad thing. For example, this, these are the slides that I had for my talk that I gave today. This is the slides I gave for my talk on Monday. Pictures are good. If you're telling a story, use lots of pictures. If you're doing code, simple text and, and, and code is fine. Live examples, also pretty cool. But here you can see, on the slides where I don't have code, it's just one or two words, maybe four. Or dot points, which I'm grouping things together. You know, re remember to think about A, B and C. That's when I would use dot points. Contrast. Make sure that the people right at the back have a chance of reading your text, no matter what the lighting. Some cost contrast options don't work the same on light backgrounds as the ba same as dark backgrounds. You have to consider these things. Go for as high a contrast as you can. Think about your font size. I actually have pretty good sight. I only wear, wear glasses when I am at conferences because if most of the time I can't read this sized font when I'm sitting in the back row. I think actually you have made a mistake if I can't read your text on your slides without my glasses on. So go big, big text, 60 point or so. If you're thinking how do I format my talk, write an essay. How would you write it if you were actually providing it as a paper and not as a talk? And then put one paragraph per slide or half a paragraph per slide, not 20 paragraphs per slide. Dot points aren't utterly evil. It's okay you can use them. It actually makes writing the talk a lot faster. Learn your pace, soon you'll know what it is, and most importantly, give more talks. Thank you.